Let's discuss the topic of buried piping. In this model, let's say that the piping goes under the ground at A6, and this entire section of piping will be buried. We can easily assign soil properties to our piping. In this case, we would have two different soil IDs, one for the vertical piping and one for the horizontal piping, assuming that the soil will be the same throughout. If the soil will change, we might have additional soil IDs. Before I assign the soil properties, I need to know the depth of the buried pipe. So I'll use my measure tool to determine that distance. I can measure from A6, the point that the piping enters the ground, to the bottom of the vertical section of pipe, A4F. And I can see that my vertical measurement is 28.5 feet. I want to take half of that to define my vertical soil properties. I can then measure from A6, the point that the buried piping enters the ground, to the center line of the horizontal pipe, which I see is 30 feet. And I'll need that to define the horizontal soil properties. So I can select my vertical section of pipe to define that first. And I can insert soil properties. And I'll just name it V1. Then I'll click to enter the soil properties. In this dialog, I have options to enter in the soil parameters and then generate the soil stiffness values according to a selection of a calculation method. Or if I have them, I can just select user as my calculation method and I can enter in the soil stiffness directly. In this example, let's say we're gonna use uh, Pipeline Research Council Institute uh, calculation method. We also have some predefined soil types. So if you don't have parameters for your site location and you're aware of what type of soil it will be, a good estimate would be using one of the predefined soil types, but it's always preferable to actually have these soil parameter values or soil stiffness values from the site location. But in my example, I'll just say that we have medium sand. And I will define that it's the vertical section of pipe. Notice that in our soil parameters, we have three columns available, uh, a low input, a high input, and then an average is automatically calculated. These can be used for examples like different seasons or different soil conditions. So if you have a wet and a dry season, you may have different soil parameters and soil stiffness values. And you can actually enter those in and AutoPipe will automatically also calculate the average. And then you can pick and choose which values you use in your analysis. So I'll leave all the default parameters for medium sand as is for my example, but I wanna change the depth to center line and make sure that's correct, which as shown over to the right in the image should be calculated as half of the vertical section of pipe, including the entry point into the ground, which we measured as 28.5 feet. This input is in inches, so I'll convert it to inches. I'm gonna divide that value by two because that's how the H is defined in the image. So I wanna enter in 171 inches. And then I'll click generate to generate the soil stiffness values. And I can accept this by clicking OK. My soil stiffness values are entered. And again, I can click OK. Next, let's define the horizontal soil properties. So I'll select from A0 to the bend at A4F. And again, I'll insert my soil properties. This time, I'll create a name for horizontal piping. So I'll just do H1, enter soil properties. Again, I'm going to use Pipeline Research Council Institute, and let's just say it's medium sand. This is horizontal piping. And my H value now is defined as the point of entry into the ground to the center line of the horizontal pipe. So we had measured that as 30 feet. If I convert that to inches, 360 inches. And I can click generate to generate my soil stiffness values. 
Now, I get a warning message because according to the Pipeline Research Council, Council Institute code, um, there is a certain H over D ratio and I'm outside of it. So it just tells me it's going to use a certain factor and I'll just accept that and click OK. But that could make a decision on maybe what calculation method you're using. Now, in this dialog box is where I can also enter data for upheaval buckling, virtual anchor length calculations, soil overburden loads, or seismic wave data. And we'll talk more about these as we go to the presentation about what those loads can be used for. But for now, I'll just click OK. And we have soil properties defined over our piping. And to show that, I'll clear my selection. And I can use my show options for soil. I could see a nice color-coded plot showing that I have a vertical soil ID and a horizontal soil ID. I could clear that plot. When I go to actually set up my analysis, notice that I have a soil stiffness column. So this is where I can pick whether I want to use the low, high, or average soil stiffness values, or if I don't want to include soil stiffness at all in this analysis set. And you can set up multiple analysis sets if you wanted to. I could create a duplicate and maybe look at one with the low values and one with the high values, for example. And ours, they're the same. But if you were to be applying different seasons or soil types, uh, you, can, you can do this. So if I say OK and analyze my model, then I can take a look at my coach dresses and other results the same way as I normally would. I do have an interact, interactive option to review my pipe soil interface force and deformation data where I can actually look at the forces and displacements for all of my soil points, including the soil points that are in between the actual points in my model. These are shown by a plus value in this dialog. Now I just went with the default soil points in this model, but you can change the spacing of the soil points. So if I open up the input grid and come to the soil tab, I have two tabs. First of all, the soil ID tab is showing the definition of the soil IDs I just created. And the soil tab shows what points the soil is applied to in my model. And this is where the maximum soil spacing can be defined. So by default, the soil spacing will be 5D or five times the diameter of the pipe. You can see that we have a 12 inch pipe defined, the actual diameter being 12.75 inches. And when you multiply that by five, you'll see our soil spacing that we have in here, which is 63.75 inches. There are general guidelines that can be followed for buried piping, and I won't go into too much detail with those, but we'll talk a bit more about it in the presentation. But generally in a model like this, you would be safer to model a soil spacing closer to 1.5 D, 1.5 times the diameter. So I'm gonna change these soil spacings to that. So if I take my 12.75 inch diameter and multiply that by 1.5, I'll change my soil spacing to 19.125 inches. So this will add many more soil points in between each of my actual points. And then I can rerun my analysis. And again, review my results. Which we may see has changed now that we have a more defined model. So let's take some time and go into a bit of a presentation to understand all of the options with buried piping. While this was showing inserting soil stiffness values over your buried piping, we do have many additional advanced analysis capabilities as well. So let's learn a little bit more about soil properties and buried piping analysis in Autopipe. Autopipe has a buried piping module that's recognized by ASCE and it can handle both static and dynamic loads. And we also have some additional advanced soil capabilities, including traffic loading, seismic wave propagation, and building settlement that we'll talk more about. 
AutoPipe can handle modeling and analysis of our buried piping systems with nonlinear properties defined. As we know, the soil supporting a buried pipe might provide nonlinear support, meaning it might soften or stiffen as the load on the soil increases. And AutoPipe does allow these nonlinear properties to be defined when creating the model. These can be either considered or ignored when you're actually running the analysis. You can define separate properties for the longitudinal soil resistance, which represents the longitudinal cohesion, for the transverse horizontal resistance, and for the transverse vertical resistance. And in the vertical direction, you can assign different properties in the upwards and downwards direction, which can account for differences in maybe uplift behavior or downwards bearing behavior. You're able to control the spacing of the soil springs inserted by auto pipe, as I showed you, by modifying the soil spring spacing. And this is really important for the user to be able to define these soil springs at closer spacings where a change in the direction occurs, like after a bend or after a T. And then the soil spacing can be increased as the pipe moves away from bends and Ts until possibly a virtual anchor is approached, after which soil springs might no longer be required. So using a nonlinear analysis can provide a more accurate estimate of the structural response for our piping systems, which includes supports with gaps and friction, or as mentioned, if the pipe is buried in soil. This nonlinear effect is specified by enabling the gaps friction soil option on the static analysis load cases dialog. And this type of analysis is an iterative process. It requires multiple passes in order to reduce the errors associated with the initial estimate to an acceptable level. After each iteration, the displacement matrix will be investigated for any effect on the stiffness matrix. And if the stiffness matrix is affected, a new stiffness matrix will be formed, and then the analysis is repeated until a solution is obtained. So since each loading condition can affect the system differently, a separate matrix might be required for each defined load case. In AutoPipe, we have an automatic soil stiffness calculator, which we took a look at. This calculates the soil stiffness values for the user. We have reference information in the help that provides guidelines for the calculations on getting the soil stiffness properties of typical soil types like sand and clay in all four directions. And we provide a couple of methods to have these values automatically calculated. We have the AutoPipe me method, the ASCE 2001 with 2005 addenda method, the PRCI method, and then the ability to enter in user values. Additionally, as was shown, the user can provide three sets of soil stiffness properties, a low, a high, and an average. The exact value of what the soil stiffness values can be are difficult to calculate because of the nature of soil and the way that the properties vary with seasons and changes. So we have the ability to take in this upper and lower limit and then AutoPipe calculates an average. We also have a tool for calculating the maximum slippage length and the virtual anchor length based on a current point, the pipe properties of that point, and the soil properties of that point. And this acts as a reference for the user to actually change the soil spacing around bends and Ts, or as you move further away from them, where the transverse displacement would become minimum. And then you can increase the soil spacing and finally anchor the pipe and provide no more soil properties. The virtual anchor length can be defined by selecting different pipe identifiers or operating cases. Keep in mind that the soil stiffness values are required to be generated before AutoPipe can calculate the virtual anchor length because they're used in these calculations. The LM, LA, and LB values that you see highlighted in green here are the maximum slippage length, the virtual anchor length, and the length of zone one respectively. The maximum slippage length defines the point at which the thermal elongation forces become equal to longitudinal yield strength of the soil. And it can be determined by equating the length of pipe over which the yield strength of the soil must act in order to resist the thermal pipe load. The maximum slippage length is calculated in order to estimate the virtual anchor length, LA. The virtual anchor length can then be estimated as one and a half to two times the maximum slippage length. It's the point where a buried length of pipe is long enough so that the axial friction along this length prevents any load or displacement at one end from translating to the other end. And it applies to a straight pipe run with no branches and no property changes. And basically piping doesn't need to be modeled beyond this length. 
LB is the length of zone one, and this is identified as the point where the lateral displacement first becomes zero. It's the closest zone to the bend, which is the area of high bending effects, which produce the major lateral displacements of the pipe in the first place. So with these calculations, we can easily adjust our maximum soil spacing correctly, similar to what we did in our example. And as shown in the example, for both the static and the dynamic analysis sets, you can pick your soil stiffness value to be assigned. We also have some new advanced soil loadings and analysis and design to ASCE and ASME rules. We can include the soil weight above the pipe, traffic loads, seismic wave propagation, and building settlement. And we have multiple soil stress analysis categories that we can add to our code compliance report from including these different loads, including the circumferential wall bending stress category, the ring buckling category, the seismic plus thermal category, and the building settlement category. Lastly, the newest buried piping capability that we've added is upheaval buckling. So generally this occurs in buried and subsea pipelines. The soil stiffness and the depth of the burial are important factors here. After the pipe is laid, this type of piping is generally not completely straight and imperfections like the one that's shown here have to exist for upheaval buckling to occur. Generally pipes are laid on the ground or the sea floor and then trenched or buried and they can be laid over irregularities like boulders or hills which can cause these imperfections in the piping. Other imperfections can also be caused as the pipe is getting buried. So the profile of the pipe in contact with the foundation is important and all of these imperfections can lead to a situation where upheaval buckling can be likely to occur. The operating conditions are also important. The pipe is installed generally in the ambient conditions. So when the pipe gets put into operation at temperatures and pressures higher than the ambient conditions, it wants to either move or expand. And this is the case with any piping, but most above ground piping is supported by restraints placed by the engineer. So this can be accounted for in the analysis. In the case of underground or subsea piping, the soil acts as a constant support along the length of the pipe and friction acts as a restraint against this growth. And this can cause high axial compressive forces in the piping. So if we look at the cross section of the buried pipe, and if we assume that the soil is constant for a large distance in the left and right directions, and of course down, the soil restraint can be considered fairly stiff in those directions. This soil restraint can easily exceed the upwards restraint, which consists of the pipe's submerged weight, the bending stiffness, and the soil cover, especially for pipes in a trench or with minimum soil on top of the pipe. So the pipe moves where it's allowed to, which in this case is in the vertical plane or up to reach a stable equilibrium position when trying to expand. And sometimes this is okay, but sometimes the large compressive loads might cause an unacceptable amount of vertical displacement or excessive yielding of the pipe material. And there are times that the pipe can move up enough to become exposed to external elements, which then can cause damage. And this is what's commonly known as upheaval buckling for offshore piping and overbend instability for onshore piping. So we've added this feature to take this loading into account and users can perform upheaval buckling analysis on buried pipelines to determine if the upheaval buckling propagation is likely to occur and also to provide a recommended soil depth to avoid this propagation. In a piping model, for any intermediate point that has soil points and upheaval buckling applied to it, AutoPipe will calculate the initial overbend. Because remember, buckling only occurs where the compressive force pushes the pipe upwards. So if this value is greater than zero, AutoPipe will run the upheaval buckling analysis and it will report the results. AutoPipe calculates the initial overbend angle using the slopes in the equation shown on the top right. And if the answer to this question is yes, and the initial overbend angle is greater than zero, as it is here, the program's gonna go back to check if these compressive forces cause a vertical deflection at that node point. If there is a positive vertical displacement showing at that node point, AutoPipe will run through the upheaval buckling analysis for that node point. And then from the analysis, the user is going to be able to review an upheaval buckling output report 
that shows the calculated axial compressive force, the buckling length, and the actual overbend angle. It will also show the vertical upward soil resistance being applied and the current soil depth to the center line of the pipe at this point. And these are all from the model inputs. And then AutoPipe will report the calculated allowed overbend angle, the required soil resistance, and the calculated required soil depth to avoid upheaval buckling. So I thank you for joining me to learn more about the AutoPipe Buried Piping Engine.